What do I expect from my employees? This is a good question. So I would say, honestly, what can Saint's employees reliably expect from Saint? And I think that's where it all starts before any employer expectation on the employee. I think the employee has to be able to expect clarity and exactly what their role is and what the expectations are. And I think that that's also something that is um, from higher and lower down the food chain of the company that changes a little bit on the lower end of the spectrum or the more entry level roles. I think that it's employees need to be able to expect pretty much hand-holding, step-by-step, step. this is your checklist for the week. I mean, at Saint, we have, for many employees, we have the 35 things that they're due that week sitting on their tasking list, et cetera. So from there, higher up, you know, more and more, you know, closer to the executive or the VP or the C-level roles, it gets a little more ambiguous, but a little more clear on what the goals are and less on the tasking. So. That's what the employees should expect from their employer when they work for us or for any company. I think that's fair that they need to know exactly what their role is, exactly what their expectations are. And then on the reverse of that, what do we at Saint kind of expect from employees? I think it's one, get your tasking done. That's bare minimum is that you gotta be able to physically do the work and understand the task and the role and the responsibility. But above that, I think it's emotional intelligence where it's dealing with team members in the correct way and working in ways that remove friction or don't add friction, but still get massive quantities of results and are really effective at your job. I think that's one. Two is just enthusiasm, right? It's just dealing with people that want to be there and enjoy their roles and enjoy what they're doing. And they see the vision that we see and because if they don't, it's almost like it's not a culture fit. It's not a good vibe for everybody. So that's what we expect from employees. And that's what I think it's fair for employees to expect from employers. How would I respond to an employee that was having a hard time digesting and buying into the vision? That's a good question. Truthfully, I think it would be the first step on our end would be to understand if there's something that just isn't clicking for them or if it's just not a good fit. Earlier in my career, you know, at this point I've worked for a few different startups. We had a handful of companies that we built and sold and there were, you know, hundreds of employees going through that door as well. So a handful of hundreds that I've seen over my career that I've gotten to hire directly or indirectly. Sometimes people just don't have the same vision, just don't have the same culture, just don't have the same business culture just don't have the same values and interests as you know the upper level management or the company, those people need to go immediately. They need to be clicked out very quickly. If an employee just doesn't get it yet and they're still kind of like maybe they're a little more shy and they haven't come out of their shell, that's on us. And we need to bring out the best in those people and, and give those individuals you know the training so they feel the confidence and the warmth and the acceptance so they feel bought into the team and plugged into the team. But if they just don't get it, they need to go very quickly and we work hard to weed those people out. And if they do and they just need those onboarding extras, then we try to provide it for them for sure. So how do I, as the leader, set culture for the company? Some of it's intentional, right? Most, usually it's an ego thing when people answer that and it's like, it's, they want to be very like, oh, here's our 10 steps to company culture, right? On our end, we haven't brought any specialists. We haven't brought any advisors on how to build culture. It's just a high performance culture of honesty, transparency, speed is really important to us. So it's more of identifying what our important things are and then holding our team to that. And then also obviously caring about the people you work with and not having just like a toxic culture. So for me, it's just you know, probably, I'd say 75% very thought out as far as like, what do we wanna see day to day when dealing with people? The other chunk has to be just authentic, me as a person trying to enforce and give people who I am as a person, like that genuine feedback of like what I'm interested in, my genuine hobbies, me genuinely being interested in their hobbies and them. And so that's kind of interactive, kind of uh, close knit culture that still is high performance. What do I do? during a typical day. So I've been asked this actually a lot and this is, I've always like thought this out because I, so there's no typical day for me. I couldn't give you a typical day. What I can give you is a typical week and that's more systemized than day to day. In a normal week, it's split up by the day as far as what the focuses are and what the game plan is. Um, one day a week is just dedicated 100% to follow-ups, touch points, check-ins, 
and making sure that low level and medium level tasking is just moving along. There's another day of the week that is primarily entirely client and investor relations. So it's making sure that our big joint venture deals from past deals are on track and syndications. Um, it's making sure that our property management is doing their job, that our asset management is on track and their tasking's on. And then the truth is the most of my week is carved out specifically for growth. We are super growth centric. We are 100% focused on that. So. The first half of what I just said is kind of more like the checklist, making sure that things are flowing and systems are moving. And then probably three plus days a week are 100% solely focused on the growth of the company. So this is things like investor relations ramp ups. How do we reach new investors and bring them into the fold so that they understand what we're doing more? So a lot of that's like education. How do we give people more value and more education, right? The other half of that is how do we build acquisitions better, right? Because the better our acquisitions and the better we can acquire things off market, typically the better returns that we get that we can pass along to our investors that help us keep our lights on and run an even tighter, better ship with better team. So therefore it benefits investors on the back end of that also. And it just gives us more opportunities. We have enough money and we have enough great deals. Then what happens is we're basically just on a growth scale forever. That's what we're trying to get to. So that's the majority of my week is carved out for that. And then the rest is for asset management systems, property management check-ins, and uh, you know some investor relations for some bigger investors and partners we have. I love this question. Um, so I, I'm really big on systemizing everything and everything being like a recipe or a checklist or a system for different parts of my life. Because, especially now that I have kids, everything must be planned to a T. So sadly, even the fun stuff sometimes, it's like in order to go on date nights or it's really hard to just have the off the cuff, like go away for the weekend or go to you know Mexico or something. So my mornings also have to be super planned out. I use an app actually, it's called coach.me. I have no affiliation to them. I just think it's a great app. It's literally just a checklist of some self-improvement things that I do throughout my day. So most of those are in the morning to answer your question directly. And it's, it's I like to read. I like to wake up very early. That's just, I go to bed early, I like to wake up early. I've been a lifelong bad sleeper, so that's kind of like what gets me through. And I wake up early, I read, and I journal. So I read about 10 pages of a book. It's just enough to get like a book done every month. And then journaling is something that is newer. I'm in a few business groups and guys have done this journaling. Um, I use the Oak journal, but you can use whatever journal you like. I do three gratitude notes, three things I'm thankful for. I write out my vision for my day, how I want that day to go. And then I write out my three most important to do's for that day. And that's it. The whole journal takes maybe five minutes, 10 minutes max. And so that's on purpose. I want to compress that in a very short period of time. There's times I don't get to it. There's times I don't read, but um, those are kind of my big two that I like to do in the mornings. And then I do the gym almost every morning, probably five, six days a week. So if I get those three things in, by the time I'm in the office, I'm like feeling very in the zone. My gratitude's there, my vision of how I want the day to go, my checklist is there, I have new information. Usually it's about some kind of business book or something that's sitting in my brain, like ready to be used. My body's active and energized and activated for that day. So that's really what I'm trying to achieve before I'm in the office every day. And um, I do that probably, you know, six days a week, seven days a week is what I shoot for, for that morning routine. I love this question. I don't think it gets talked about enough. So I work a lot, probably in at least one day every week and making sure that I'm on top of my stuff just because we're in a big growth phase, so that's important. So when I get things done outside of the office, it's a huge priority to make time for the most important things. So it's not a lot of leisure these days outside of the office. We don't get to, you know, not a whole lot of relaxed time, but it is getting a lot done in a short period of time. And the most important things without a doubt are 
I want to see my family. I have a big family, a big extended family. I want to see them. I want to spend time with them and then spend time with my kids and my partner. And I want us to, we plan a lot of things out in advance. We try to travel every six weeks and go away for the weekend. My way to kind of continue to reconnect with the busy schedule. And it's just making priority time to have one-on-one -on -one with kind of people that I really care about on the personal side. So friends, I gotta plan those way in advance, like friend stuff, it's, uh, you know, usually they're, I don't know, weeks and weeks in advance, but uh, most weekends and most nights, I'm trying to get time with the family. I like to, hobby-wise, I like to stay pretty active and do things in nature or physically. That's kind of my main thing I wanna be into. And then the others, I play a lot of chess. I suck and I'm brand new to it. I didn't play my entire life, but I'm really enjoying kind of Chess just feels natural for me. It's something that I just, as soon as I started playing, I latched on very quickly and uh, it gets my mind really working the ways that I like it to. It's really strategic. So that's been a huge uh, kind of new thing for me. So if you ever or anybody wants to play me in chess, I will play your game. I'm on chess.com. What am I most proud of as it relates to Saint? I would say that I think what I'm most proud of is that we're in the big leagues as far as I look at it. I 100% see some of the biggest companies in the world that work technically in the same ocean. We might be a tiny little, you know, like plankton and they might be a great white shark or a whale or something. But I feel when we built the other companies, we found massive success and we were essentially from the bottom of an industry to near the top and we had multiple companies that were operating at the top of their respective places in that industry. And so I felt like I actually hit my ceiling there and I feel, I feel like our company hit our ceiling there and just the growth wasn't, there wasn't growth to the moon that we could tap into. And here in the investment space, I think that we can help investors in a very major way, something I'm very passionate about. I think we can give back with education, something I'm very passionate about. And I think we can have that competitive spirit to take on just the mo some of the most massive companies in the world, which I'm also very passionate about. So those are the three things that really pump me up every day for what we're doing. If I was a Gen Z or millennial and I had $10,000 and was just starting out and wanted to invest it, how would I do so? Um, I, without a doubt, 100 million percent would invest in education. No question. I would find a course that matches what my skill set or my interest was, and I would go all in on that. Not even a hesitation when I say that, because the number one issue is $10,000 doesn't actually buy you anything as far as real estate goes. You cannot get into real estate for $10,000. There's sure there might be some secret course about, you know, buying houses for free or what, I don't know. I don't believe it. My entire real estate career for nearly 20 years has proven that that's not possible. I've tapped every possibility of like the zero down payment stuff. But $10,000 will buy you a really nice course on how to make more money, okay? The idea is not investing in assets so much at that stage if you're on the younger end of your life spectrum. It's to ramp up your income as soon as possible because from there you have a larger trajectory for your whole life. So if you're here, the slow upswing, instead you jump up in income, then your slow upswing is on a higher scale for your whole life. So that's, I tell you education, you wanna get there, and then you want to get around networking and get around people that are doing the most successful things possible. So let's say you spend all in on that six grand and you have 4,000 left over, I'd buy an ETF, probably a whole index ETF for the S&P 500, like a VU Vanguard or a, a SPY, but I would need to do anything I could to buy education to make more money and raise my income 100%. Why did I start Saint? So the ego answer to that would be because I wanted to, or because you know I just had this crystal ball and like I just saw the future, et cetera. The truth is that I actually had to because I was in a position where the companies that we were selling were in a very different market and in a very different space. And we, and I was soul searching of what the next step would be after these companies. We were positioning them for disposition, AKA getting them ready to sell. And we were putting all the pieces together. We were getting our books and everything in order. We were nailing down our SOPs to hand off to the buyer. And 
it was a moment where we had some syndications again we just found opportunities. It wasn't this master plan at that time. We just found really good opportunities, things that were paying ridiculous cash on cash numbers and brought in investors for that. So we needed an entity to kind of like do very minor branding, right? And very, you know, just kind of a name attached to it. And then also what would the focus be and what would be that kind of the flagship after we sold that other group of companies. So Saint kind of started out of a necessity from for a place of timing. The name just kind of naturally, it just felt right. It just was a name that clicked very quickly. Um, and it was, it wasn't until a little bit later when we really started hitting our stride with some of the syndications and some of the deals where we were squeezing out great returns. And I found most importantly, that the real estate side to me saved pretty much possibly my life, truthfully, possibly my life at a stage where my companies were crushing me emotionally, physically, mentally, spiritually, literally my health failing, literally relationships where I thought I was getting married to a person, those fell apart, right? So it was something where, you know, the real estate and the investment space leveled out my income where it was the super bumpy, super scary road all the time where we were doing seven figures one month. And then the next month we were, I was literally putting money back in to keep things going, right? And so um, those investments kind of, they saved me in many ways. I know that's kind of maybe a little over, um, over dramatic, but I really do feel that way. Saint felt like the right name for that. And so it kind of came about that I knew I could I knew the opportunity. I knew what we could bring to other people. We had already demonstrated a lot of success there and we knew we could keep rolling that out to more and more investors with more and more opportunities. So it just, that's kind of how the name clicked, how the company clicked, half out of necessity, half out of like a big picture, you know, something really exciting that we thought we could do and offer people. And um, all in all, it's kind of been like, you know, equal parts long-term planning and equal parts like, seeing really cool opportunities in the moment. So as the new kid on the block, how would I go about making connections with the big guys in the space? I would say that this is severely, severely overestimated of how hard it is. I think it's actually, and again, networking has been a big part of my career pretty much from the beginning. And it's something that has taken me leaps and bounds but I've also spent countless hours finding different networking groups, different business groups, et cetera, et cetera. The people that you're looking for are more accessible than you think, but you also have to be the person that they want to be around too. So I think that if you're younger, you think that you're less in common with these people that might be older or further ahead in their career, and you actually have the freaking secret biggest advantage to networking is that you're young and enthusiastic. So I have friends that our entire relationship is based on them knowing a lot and me knowing a little and me just being like, I love everything that you're doing. Tell me more, I'm pumped, I just wanna learn. That's all I have to give you is just learn and give you new insight of exactly what you're telling me. So the only thing I give them is enthusiasm and a fresh take on what they're teaching. And most of the times from my mentors that I've get, gotten back from them is them saying things like, when you teach another, you learn twice or something along those lines. And um, it's been very rewarding relationships. So that's one side. If someone's way up here and you're way down here, you think that you have nothing to offer them, but the, just the enthusiasm, the positivity, and giving them a fresh feedback on what they're telling you, that's a, that's a lot for many people. And it's a really cool mentor-mentee relationship. And then on the other side of just creating a peer group, much less of a mentor-mentee, creating a peer group, you kind of have to earn that a little bit. I would say that a lot of that you have to shoulder that and you have to be in a position where they speak one language and you speak the same language. So some groups that I was slowly climbing the ladder being a part of, first off, you're gonna see like the local real estate investment associations. They're okay, eventually, you know, maybe you know enough people or, or that's something that the networking you might outgrow or maybe you don't, right? Maybe that's a perfect group for you. But um, that's a good place to start for real estate. For business in general, if you wanna be around entrepreneurs, there's tons of amazing groups. There's some locally here where I live, you know, like IEC is a local one. And then there's some national ones and global ones like entrepreneur organization is 
I, you know, it's like 25,000, 30,000 members worldwide. I'm a part of that. I can pick up the phone and call any of those people and be like, hey, we've never met, but we're part of this group. And they're like, how are you? It's great to talk to you. It's an instant connection. So um, that's pay to play to some degree, but it's also fantastic people. As far as industry specific, you've got to hit events. The bigger, the better with a lot of people. Things like conventions are absolute amazing networking, but you gotta have the guts to go talk to people. Because at some point, who cares? You would just be sitting on your couch. So go talk to every freaking person in the room. I don't wanna hear social anxiety. I don't wanna hear like it's my first time at the, it's like smile, walk up and say, hi, my name is blah, blah, blah. They will shake your hand and you will get some awkward interactions. And then the other half, are going to be amazingly rewarding and you're gonna meet a lot of people and the money that you spend on those is like a drop in the bucket for the value that you'll get back but it all starts with you and you like you have to take those steps and you'll get multiplied in the rewards from those from networking.